Moose, Wikipedia article audio. The moose or elk, Alces alces, is the largest extant species in the deer family. Moose are distinguished by the broad, flat antlers of the males, other members of the family have antlers with a dendritic configuration. Moose typically inhabit boreal forests and temperate broadleaf and mixed forests of the northern hemisphere in temperate to subarctic climates. Hunting and other human activities have caused a reduction in the size of the moose's range over time. Moose have been reintroduced to some of their former habitats. Currently, most moose are found in Canada, Alaska, New England, Fennoscandia, Baltic states, and Russia. Their diet consists of both terrestrial and aquatic vegetation. The most common moose predators are the grey wolf along with bears and humans. Unlike most other deer species, moose are solitary animals and do not form herds. Although generally slow-moving and sedentary, moose can become aggressive and move quickly if angered or startled. Their mating season in the autumn features energetic fights between males competing for a female. Etymology and Naming Habitat, range, and distribution North America Decline in population Europe and Asia New Zealand Populations Subspecies Description and anatomy Antlers Fur Size and weight Ecology and Biology Diet Natural Predators Social Structure and Reproduction Aggression Relationship with Humans History As Food Vehicle Collisions Domestication Paleontology Alces alces is called a moose in North American English, but an elk in British English, its scientific name comes from its name in Latin. The word elk in North American English refers to a completely different species of deer, the Cervus canadensis, also called the wapiti. A mature male moose is called a bull, a mature female a cow, and an immature moose of either sex a calf. The word elk originated in Proto-Germanic, from which Old English evolved and has cognates in other Indo-European languages, e.g. elk in Danish slash Norwegian, elk in Swedish, alnus in Latvian, elch in German, and los in Polish. In the continental European languages, these forms of the word elk almost always refer to the alces alces. The word moose had first entered English by 1606 and is borrowed from the Algonquian languages, and possibly involved forms from multiple languages mutually reinforcing one another. The Proto-Algonquian form was asterisk MOSWA. The moose became extinct in Britain during the Bronze Age, long before the European arrival in the Americas. The youngest bones were found in Scotland and are roughly 3,900 years old. The word elk remained in usage because of its existence in continental Europe but, without any living animals around to serve as a reference, the meaning became rather vague to most speakers of English, who used elk to refer to large deer in general. Dictionaries of the 18th century simply described elk as a deer that was as large as a horse. Confusingly, the word elk is used in North America to refer to a different animal, Cervus canadensis, which is also called by the Algonquian indigenous name, Wapiti. The British began colonizing America in the 17th century and found two common species of deer for which they had no names. The wapiti appeared very similar to the red deer of Europe although it was much larger and was not red. 
The moose was a rather strange-looking deer to the colonists, and they often adopted local names for both. In the early days of American colonization, the wapiti was often called a gray moose and the moose was often called a black moose, but early accounts of the animals varied wildly, adding to the confusion. The wapiti is superficially very similar to the red deer of Central and Western Europe although it is distinctly different behaviorally and genetically. Early European explorers in North America, particularly in Virginia where there were no moose, called the wapiti elk because of its size and resemblance to familiar-looking deer like the red deer. The moose resembled the German elk, which was less familiar to the British colonists. For a long time neither species had an official name but were called a variety of things. Eventually, in North America the wapiti became known as an elk while the moose retained its anglicized Native American name. In 1736, Samuel Dale wrote to the Royal Society of Great Britain. The common light grey moose, called by the Indians, wampus, and the large or black moose, which is the beast whose horns I hear with present. As to the grey moose, I take it to be no larger than what Mr. John Clayton, in his account of the Virginia quadrupeds, calls the elk, was in all respects like those of our red deer or stags, only larger. The black moose is accounted a very large creature. The stag, buck, or male of this kind has a palmed horn, not like that of our common or fallow deer, but the palm is much longer, and more like that of the German elk. After expanding for most of the 20th century, the moose population of North America has been in steep decline since the 1990s. Populations expanded greatly with improved habitat and protection, but for unknown reasons, the moose population is declining rapidly. In North America, the moose range includes almost all of Canada, most of Alaska, northern New England and upstate New York, the upper Rocky Mountains, northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, Michigan's Upper Peninsula, and Isle Royale and Lake Superior. This massive range, containing diverse habitats, contains four of the six North American subspecies. In the West, moose populations extend well north into Canada, and more isolated groups have been verified as far south as the mountains of Utah and Colorado and as far west as the Lake Wenatchee area of the Washington Cascades. The range includes Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and smaller areas of Washington and Oregon. Moose have extended their range southwards in the western Rocky Mountains with initial sightings in Yellowstone National Park in 1868, and then to the northern slope of the Uinta Mountains in Utah in the first half of the 20th century. This is the southernmost naturally established moose population in the United States. In 1978, a few breeding pairs were reintroduced in western Colorado and the state's moose population is now more than 1,000. In northeastern North America, the eastern moose's history is very well documented. Moose meat was often a staple in the diet of Native Americans going back centuries, and it is a tribe that occupied present-day coastal Rhode Island that gave this deer its distinctive name in American English. The Native Americans often used moose hides for leather and its meat as an ingredient in pemmican, a type of dried jerky used as a source of sustenance in winter or on long journeys. Eastern tribes also valued moose leather as a source for moccasins and other items. The historical range of the subspecies extended from well into Quebec, the Maritimes, and eastern Ontario south to include all of New England finally ending in the very northeastern tip of Pennsylvania in the west, cutting off somewhere near the mouth of the Hudson River in the east. 
the moose has been extinct in much of the eastern U.S. for as long as 150 years, due to colonial-era overhunting and destruction of its habitat, Dutch, French, and British colonial sources all attest to its presence in the mid-17th century from Maine south to areas within a hundred miles of present-day Manhattan. However, by the 1870s, only a handful of moose existed in this entire region in very remote pockets of forest, less than 20% of suitable habitat remained. Since the 1980s, however, moose populations have rebounded, thanks to regrowth of plentiful food sources, abandonment of farmland, better land management, cleanup of pollution, and natural dispersal from the Canadian Maritimes and Quebec. South of the Canada-US border, Maine has most of the population with a 2012 headcount of about 76,000 moose. Dispersals from Maine over the years have resulted in healthy, growing populations each in Vermont and New Hampshire, notably near bodies of water and as high up as 3,000 feet above sea level in the mountains. In Massachusetts, moose went extinct by 1,870, but recolonized the state in the 1960s, with the population expanding from Vermont and New Hampshire. By 2010, the population was estimated at 850 to 950. Moose re-established populations in eastern New York and Connecticut and appeared headed south towards the Catskill Mountains, a former habitat. In the Midwest U.S., moose are primarily limited to the upper Great Lakes region, but strays, primarily immature males, have been found as far south as eastern Iowa. For unknown reasons, the moose population is declining rapidly in the Midwest. Moose were successfully introduced on Newfoundland in 1878 and 1904, where they are now the dominant ungulate, and somewhat less successfully on Anticosti Island in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Since the 1990s, moose populations have declined dramatically in much of temperate North America, although they remain stable in Arctic and subarctic regions. The exact causes of specific die-offs are not determined, but most documented mortality events were due to wolf predation, bacterial infection due to injuries sustained from predators, and parasites from white-tail deer to which moose have not developed a natural defense, such as liver flukes, brain worms, and winter tick infestations. One of the leading hypotheses among biologists for generalized, non-hunting declines in moose populations at the southern extent of their range is increasing heat stress brought on by the rapid seasonal temperature upswings as a result of human-induced climate change. Biologists studying moose populations typically use warm season heat stress thresholds of between 14 and 24 degrees Celsius. However, the minor average temperature increase of 1.5 to 2 degree Fahrenheit over the last 100 years have resulted in milder winters that induce favorable conditions for ticks, parasites, and other invasive species to flourish within the southern range of moose habitat in North America. This leading hypothesis is supported by mathematical models that explore moose populations' responses to future climate change projections. The moose population in New Hampshire fell from 7,500 in the early 2000s to a current estimate of 4,000 and in Vermont the numbers were down to 2,200 from a high of 5,000 animals in 2005. Much of the decline has been attributed to the winter tick with about 70% of the moose calf deaths across Maine and New Hampshire due to the parasite. In Europe, Moose are currently found in large numbers throughout Norway, Sweden, Finland, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, with more modest numbers in the southern Czech Republic, Belarus, and northern Ukraine. 
They are also widespread through Russia on up through the borders with Finland south towards the border with Estonia, Belarus and Ukraine and stretching far away eastwards to the Yenisei River in Siberia. The European moose was native to most temperate areas with suitable habitat on the continent and even Scotland from the end of the last ice age, as Europe had a mix of temperate boreal and deciduous forest. Up through classical times, the species was certainly thriving in both Gaul and Magna Germania, as it appears in military and hunting accounts of the age. However, as the Roman era faded into medieval times, the beast slowly disappeared. Soon after the reign of Charlemagne, the moose disappeared from France, where its range extended from Normandy in the north to the Pyrenees in the south. Farther east, it survived in Alsace and the Netherlands until the 9th century as the marshlands in the latter were drained and the forests were cleared away for feudal lands in the former. It was gone from Switzerland by the year 1000, gone from the Western Czech Republic by 1300, gone from Mecklenburg in Germany by C1600, and has been gone from Hungary and the Caucasus since the 18th and 19th century respectively. By the early 20th century, the very last strongholds of the European moose appeared to be in Fenoscandian areas and patchy tracts of Russia, with a few migrants found in what is now Estonia and Lithuania. The USSR and Poland managed to restore portions of the range within its borders, but political complications limited the ability to reintroduce it to other portions of its range. Attempts in 1930 and again in 1967 in marshland north of Berlin were unsuccessful. At present in Poland, populations are recorded in the Bibrza River Valley, Campinos, and in Bialoiza Forest. It has migrated into other parts of Eastern Europe and has been spotted in Eastern and Southern Germany. Unsuccessful thus far in recolonizing these areas via natural dispersal from source populations in Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, Czech Republic, and Slovakia, it appears to be having more success migrating south into the Caucasus. It is listed under Appendix 3 of the Bern Convention. In 2008, Two moose were reintroduced into the Scottish Highlands in Allerdale Wilderness Reserve. The East Asian moose populations confine themselves mostly to the territory of Russia, with much smaller populations in Mongolia and northeastern China. Moose populations are relatively stable in Siberia and increasing on the Kamchatka Peninsula. In Mongolia and China, where poaching took a great toll on moose, forcing them to near extinction, they are protected, but enforcement of the policy is weak and demand for traditional medicines derived from deer parts is high. In 1978, the Regional Hunting Department transported 45 young moose to the center of Kamchatka. These moose were brought from Chukotka, home to the largest moose on the planet. Kamchatka now regularly is responsible for the largest trophy moose shot around the world each season. As it is a fertile environment for moose, with a milder climate, less snow and an abundance of food, moose quickly bred and settled along the valley of the Kamchatka River and many surrounding regions. The population in the past 20 years has risen to over 2,900 animals. The size of the moose varies. Following Bergman's rule, population in the south usually grow smaller, while moose in the north and northeast can match the imposing sizes of the Alaskan moose and are prized by trophy hunters. In 1900, an attempt to introduce moose into the Hokitika area failed, then in 1910 10 moose were introduced into fjordland. This area is considered a less than suitable habitat, and subsequent low numbers of sightings and kills have led to some presumption of this population's failure. 
The last proven sighting of a moose in New Zealand was in 1952. However, a moose antler was found in 1972, and DNA tests showed that hair collected in 2002 was from a moose. There has been extensive searching, and while automated cameras failed to capture photographs, evidence was seen of bedding spots, browsing and antler marks. North America Europe and Asia Bull moose have antlers like other members of the deer family. Cows select mates based on antler size. Bull moose use dominant displays of antlers to discourage competition and will spar or fight rivals. The size and growth rate of antlers is determined by diet and age, symmetry reflects health. The male's antlers grow as cylindrical beams projecting on each side of the head at right angles to the midline of the skull, and then fork. The lower prong of this fork may be either simple, or divided into two or three tines, with some flattening. Moose antlers are broad and palmate with tines along the outer edge. The antlers of mature Alaskan adult bull moose have a normal maximum spread greater than 200 cm. By the age of 13, moose antlers decline in size and symmetry. The widest spread recorded was 210 cm across. Antler beam diameter, not the number of tines, indicates age. In North America moose antlers are usually larger than those of Eurasian moose and have two lobes on each side, like a butterfly. Eurasian moose antlers resemble a seashell, with a single lobe on each side. In the North Siberian moose, the posterior division of the main fork divides into three tines with no distinct flattening. In the common moose this branch usually expands into a broad palmation, with one large tine at the base and a number of smaller snags on the free border. There is, however, a Scandinavian breed of the common moose in which the antlers are simpler and recall those of the East Siberian animals. The palmation appears to be more marked in North American moose than in the typical Scandinavian moose. After the mating season males drop their antlers to conserve energy for the winter. A new set of antlers will then regrow in the spring. Antlers take three to five months to fully develop, making them one of the fastest growing animal organs. Antler growth is nourished by an extensive system of blood vessels in the skin covering, which contains numerous hair follicles that give it a velvet texture. This requires intense grazing on a highly nutritious diet. By September the velvet is removed by rubbing and thrashing which changes the color of the antlers. Immature bulls may not shed their antlers for the winter, but retain them until the following spring. Birds, carnivores, and rodents eat dropped antlers as they are full of protein and moose themselves will eat antler velvet for the nutrients. If a bull moose is castrated, either by accidental or chemical means, he will quickly shed his current set of antlers and then immediately begin to grow a new set of misshapen and deformed antlers that he will wear the rest of his life without ever shedding again. The distinctive-looking appendages are the source of several myths and legends among many groups of Inuit as well as several other tribes of indigenous peoples of North America. In extremely rare circumstances, a cow moose may grow antlers. This is usually attributed to a hormone imbalance. In Canada, there are an estimated 500,000 to 1 million moose with 150,000 in Newfoundland in 2007 descended from just four that were introduced in the 1900s, in United States, probably around 300,000, as follows, Alaska, the state's Department of Fish and Game estimated 200,000 in 2011, Northeast, a wildlife ecologist estimated 50,000 in New York and New England in 2007, 
with expansion expected, Rocky Mountain states, Wyoming is said to have the largest share in its six-state region, and its fish. And Game Commission estimated 7,692 in 2009, Upper Midwest, Michigan estimated 433 in 2011, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources 2040 in 2003, Minnesota 5,600 in its northeast in 2010, and under 100 in its northwest in 2009, North Dakota closed, due to low moose population, one of its moose hunting geographic units in 2011, and issued 162 single-kill licenses to hunters, each restricted to one of the remaining nine units. Finland, in 2009, there was a summer population of 115,000 moose, Norway, in 2009, there were a winter population of around 120,000 moose. In 2015 31,131 moose were shot. In 1999, a record number of 39,422 moose were shot. Latvia, in 2015, there were 21,000 moose. Estonia, 13,260 individuals, Poland, 2,800 individuals, Czech Republic, maximum of 50 animals, Russia, in 2007, there were approximately 600,000 moose, Sweden, summer population is estimated to be 300,000-400,000 moose. Around 100,000 are shot each fall. About 10,000 are killed in traffic accidents yearly. Their fur consists of two layers, top layer of long guard hairs and a soft woolly undercoat. The guard hairs are hollow and filled with air for better insulation, which also helps them stay afloat when swimming. On average, an adult moose stands 1.42.1 m high at the shoulder, which is more than a foot higher than the next largest deer on average, the elk. Males normally weigh from 380 to 700 kilograms and females typically weigh 200 to 490 kilograms, depending on racial or clinal as well as individual age or nutritional variations. The head and body length is 2.43.1 m, with the vestigial tail adding only a further 512 cm. The largest of all the races is the Alaskan subspecies, which can stand over 2.1 m at the shoulder, has a span across the antlers of 1.8 m and averages 634.5 kg in males and 478 kg in females. Typically, however, the antlers of a mature bull are between 1.2 m and 1.5 m. The largest confirmed size for this species was a bull shot at the Yukon River in September 1897 that weighed 820 kg and measured 2.33 m high at the shoulder. There have been reported cases of even larger moose including a bull that reportedly scaled 1,180 kilograms, but none are authenticated and some may not be considered reliable. Behind only the two species of bison, the moose is the second largest land animal in both North America and Europe. The moose is a herbivore and is capable of consuming many types of plant or fruit. The average adult moose needs to consume 9,770 kilocalories per day to maintain its body weight. Much of a moose's energy is derived from terrestrial vegetation, mainly consisting of forbs and other non-grasses, and fresh shoots from trees such as willow and birch. These plants are rather low in sodium, and moose generally need to consume a good quantity of aquatic plants. While much lower in energy, 
These plants provide the moose with its sodium requirements, and as much as half of their diet usually consists of aquatic plant life. In winter, moose are often drawn to roadways, to lick salt that is used as a snow and ice melter. A typical moose, weighing 360 kg, can eat up to 32 kg of food per day. Moose lack upper front teeth, but have eight sharp incisors on the lower jaw. They also have a tough tongue, lips, and gums, which aid in the eating of woody vegetation. Moose have six pairs of large, flat molars and, ahead of those, six pairs of premolars, to grind up their food. A moose's upper lip is very sensitive, to help distinguish between fresh shoots and harder twigs, and the lip is prehensile, for grasping their food. In the summer, moose may use this prehensile lip for grabbing branches and pulling, stripping the entire branch of leaves in a single mouthful, or for pulling forbs, like dandelions or aquatic plants up by the base, roots and all. A moose's diet often depends on its location, but they seem to prefer the new growths from deciduous trees with a high sugar content, such as white birch, trembling aspen and striped maple, among many others. To reach high branches, a moose may bend small saplings down, using its prehensile lip, mouth, or body. For larger trees a moose may stand erect and walk upright on its hind legs, allowing it to reach branches up to 4.26 meters or higher above the ground. Moose also eat many aquatic plants, including lilies and pondweed. Moose are excellent swimmers and are known to wade into water to eat aquatic plants. This trait serves a second purpose in cooling down the moose on summer days and ridding itself of black flies. Moose are thus attracted to marshes and river banks during warmer months as both provide suitable vegetation to eat and water to wet themselves in. Moose have been known to dive underwater to reach plants on lake bottoms, and the complex snout may assist the moose in this type of feeding. Moose are the only deer that are capable of feeding underwater. As an adaptation for feeding on plants underwater, the nose is equipped with fatty pads and muscles that close the nostrils when exposed to water pressure, preventing water from entering the nose. Other species can pluck plants from the water too, but these need to raise their heads in order to swallow. Moose are not grazing animals but browsers. Like giraffes, moose carefully select foods with less fiber and more concentrations of nutrients. Thus, the moose's digestive system has evolved to accommodate this relatively low-fiber diet. Unlike most hooved, domesticated animals, moose cannot digest hay, and feeding it to a moose can be fatal. The moose's varied and complex diet is typically expensive for humans to provide, and free-range moose require a lot of forested acreage for sustainable survival, which is one of the main reasons moose have never been widely domesticated. A full-grown moose has few enemies except Siberian tigers which regularly prey on adult moose, but a pack of grey wolves can still pose a threat, especially to females with calves. Brown bears are also known to prey on moose of various sizes, including many pregnant adult cows in some parts of Alaska and Scandinavia and even the rare bull moose, and are the only predator besides the wolf to attack moose both in Eurasia and North America. However, brown bears are more likely to take over a wolf kill or to take young moose than to hunt adult moose on their own. American black bears and cougars can be significant predators of moose calves in May and June and can, in rare instances, prey on adults. Wolverine are most likely to eat moose as carrion but have killed moose, including adults, when the large ungulates are weakened by harsh winter conditions.
Killer whales are the moose's only known marine predator as they have been known to prey on moose swimming between islands out of North America's northwest coast, however, there is at least one recorded instance of a moose preyed upon by a Greenland shark. In some areas, moose are the primary source of food for wolves. Moose usually flee upon detecting wolves. Wolves usually follow moose at a distance of 100 to 400 meters, occasionally at a distance of 2 to 3 kilometers. Attacks from wolves against young moose may last seconds, though sometimes they can be drawn out for days with adults. Sometimes, wolves will chase moose into shallow streams or onto frozen rivers, where their mobility is greatly impeded. Moose will sometimes stand their ground and defend themselves by charging at the wolves or lashing out at them with their powerful hooves. Wolves typically kill moose by tearing at their haunches and perineum, causing massive blood loss. Occasionally, a wolf may immobilize a moose by biting its sensitive nose, the pain of which can paralyze a moose. Wolf packs primarily target calves and elderly animals, but can and will take healthy, adult moose. Moose between the ages of 2 and 8 are seldom killed by wolves. Though moose are usually hunted by packs, there are cases in which single wolves have successfully killed healthy, fully grown moose. Research into moose predation suggests that their response to perceived threats is learned rather than instinctual. In practical terms this means moose are more vulnerable in areas where wolf or bear populations were decimated in the past but are now rebounding. These same studies suggest, however, that moose learn quickly and adapt, fleeing an area if they hear or smell wolves, bears, or scavenger birds such as ravens. Moose are also subject to various diseases and forms of parasitism. In Northern Europe, the moose bot fly is a parasite whose range seems to be spreading. Moose are mostly diurnal. They are generally solitary with the strongest bonds between mother and calf. Although moose rarely gather in groups, there may be several in close proximity during the mating season. Mating occurs in September and October. The males are polygamous and will seek several females to breed with. During this time both sexes will call to each other. Males produce heavy grunting sounds that can be heard from up to 500 meters away, while females produce whale-like sounds. Males will fight for access to females. Initially, the males assess which of them is dominant and one bull may retreat, however, the interaction can escalate to a fight using their antlers. Female moose have an eight-month gestation period, usually bearing one calf, or twins if food is plentiful, in May or June. Newborn moose have fur with a reddish hue in contrast to the brown appearance of an adult. The young will stay with the mother until just before the next young are born. The lifespan of an average moose is about 15-25 years. Calves nursing in spring Calves stay near their mothers at all times. This calf is almost ready to leave its mother. This yearling was probably recently chased away by its pregnant mother. Moose are not usually aggressive towards humans, but can be provoked or frightened to behave with aggression. In terms of raw numbers, they attack more people than bears and wolves combined, but usually with only minor consequences. In the Americas, moose injure more people than any other wild mammal, and worldwide, only hippopotamuses injure more. When harassed or startled by people or in the presence of a dog, moose may charge. Also, as with bears or any wild animal, moose that have become used to being fed by people may act aggressively when denied food. During the fall mating season, 
bull moose may be aggressive toward humans because of the high hormone levels they experience. Cows with young calves are very protective and will attack humans who come too close, especially if they come between mother and calf. Unlike other dangerous animals, moose are not territorial, and do not view humans as food, and will therefore usually not pursue humans if they simply run away. Like any wild animal, moose are unpredictable and should be given a respectful amount of space. They are most likely to attack if annoyed or harassed, or if their personal space has been encroached upon. A moose that has been harassed may vent its anger on anyone in the vicinity, and they often do not make distinctions between their tormentors and innocent passers-by. Moose are very limber animals with highly flexible joints and sharp, pointed hooves, and are capable of kicking with both front and back legs. Unlike other large, hoofed mammals, such as horses, moose can kick in all directions including sideways. Therefore, there is no safe side from which to approach. However, moose often give warning signs prior to attacking, displaying their aggression by means of body language. The maintaining of eye contact is usually the first sign of aggression while laid-back ears or a lowered head is a definite sign of agitation. If the hairs on the back of the moose's neck and shoulders stand up, a charge is usually imminent. The Anchorage Visitor Centers warn tourists that, a moose with its hackles raised is a thing to fear. Studies suggest that the calls made by female moose during the rut not only call the males but can actually induce a bull to invade another bull's harem and fight for control of it. This in turn means that the cow moose has at least a small degree of control over which bulls she mates with. Moose often show aggression to other animals as well, especially predators. Bears are common predators of moose calves and, rarely, adults. Alaskan moose have been reported to successfully fend off attacks from black bears, brown bears and grizzlies. Moose have been known to stomp attacking wolves, which makes them less preferred as prey to the wolves. Moose are fully capable of killing bears and wolves. A moose of either sex that is confronted by danger may let out a loud roar more resembling that of a predator than a prey animal. European moose are often more aggressive than North American moose, such as the moose in Sweden, which often become very agitated at the sight of a predator. However, like all ungulates known to attack predators, the more aggressive individuals are always darker in color. European rock drawings and cave paintings reveal that moose have been hunted since the Stone Age. Excavations in Albi, Sweden, adjacent to the Stora Alvaret have yielded moose antlers in wooden hut remains from 6000 BCE, indicating some of the earliest moose hunting in northern Europe. In northern Scandinavia one can still find remains of trapping pits used for hunting moose. These pits which can be up to 4 times 7 m wide and 2 m deep, would have been camouflaged with branches and leaves. They would have had steep sides lined with planks, making it impossible for the moose to escape once it fell in. The pits are normally found in large groups, crossing the moose's regular paths and stretching over several kilometers. Remains of wooden fences designed to guide the animals toward the pits have been found in bogs and peat. In Norway, an early example of these trapping devices has been dated to around 3700 BC. Trapping elk in pits is an extremely effective hunting method, and as early as the 16th century the Norwegian government tried to restrict their use. Nevertheless, the method was in use until the 19th century. The earliest recorded description of the moose is in Julius Caesar's Commentarii de Bello Gallico, where it is described thus. There are also, 
which are called moose. The shape of these, and the varied color of their skins, is much like rose, but in size they surpass them a little and are destitute of horns, and have legs without joints and ligatures, nor do they lie down for the purpose of rest, nor, if they have been thrown down by any accident, can they raise or lift themselves up. Trees serve as beds to them, they lean themselves against them, and thus reclining only slightly, they take their rest, when the huntsmen have discovered from the footsteps of these animals whither they are accustomed to betake themselves, they either undermine all the trees at the roots, or cut into them so far that the upper part of the trees may appear to be left standing. When they have lent upon them, according to their habit, they knock down by their weight the unsupported trees, and fall down themselves along with them. In Book 8, Chapter 16 of Pliny the Elder's Natural History from 77 AD The elk and an animal called Aeclus, which is presumably the same animal, are described thus. There is, also, the moose which strongly resembles our steers, except that it is distinguished by the length of the ears and of the neck. There is also the Aeclus, which is produced in the land of Scandinavia, it has never been seen in this city, although we have had descriptions of it from many persons, it is not unlike the moose, but has no joints in the hind leg. Hence, it never lies down but reclines against a tree while it sleeps, it can only be taken by previously cutting into the tree, and thus laying a trap for it, as otherwise, it would escape through its swiftness. Its upper lip is so extremely large, for which reason it is obliged to go backwards when grazing, otherwise, by moving onwards, the lip would get doubled up. Moose are hunted as a game species in many of the countries where they are found. Moose meat tastes, wrote Henry David Thoreau in the Maine woods, like tender beef, with perhaps more flavor, sometimes like veal. While the flesh has protein levels similar to those of other comparable red meats, it has a low fat content and the fat that is present consists of a higher proportion of polyunsaturated fats rather than saturated fats. Cadmium levels are high in Finnish elk liver and kidneys, with the result that consumption of these organs from elk more than one year old is prohibited in Finland. Cadmium intake has been found to be elevated amongst all consumers of elk meat though the elk meat was found to contribute only slightly to the daily cadmium intake. However the consumption of moose liver or kidneys significantly increased cadmium intake, with the study revealing that heavy consumers of moose organs have a relatively narrow safety margin below the levels which would probably cause adverse health effects. Dr. Valerius Geist, who emigrated to Canada from the Soviet Union, wrote in his 1999 book Moose, Behavior, Ecology, Conservation. In Sweden, no fall menu is without a mouth-watering moose dish. The Swedes fence their highways to reduce moose fatalities and design moose-proof cars. Sweden is less than half as large as the Canadian province of British Columbia but the annual take of moose in Sweden upward of 150,000 is twice that of the total moose harvest in North America. Boosting of moose populations in Alaska for hunting purposes is one of the reasons given for allowing aerial or airborne methods to remove wolves in designated areas, e.g., Craig Madrid. A kill of 124 wolves would thus translate to 1,488 moose or 2,976 caribou or some combination thereof. Many scientists believe that this artificial inflation of game populations is actually detrimental to both caribou and moose populations as well as the ecosystem as a whole. This is because studies have shown that when these game populations are artificially boosted, 
it leads to both habitat destruction and a crash in these populations. The center of mass of a moose is above the hood of most passenger cars. In a collision, the impact crushes the front roof beams and individuals in the front seats. Collisions of this type are frequently fatal, seat belts and airbags confer little protection. In collisions with higher vehicles, most of the deformation is to the front of the vehicle and the passenger compartment is largely spared. Moose collisions have prompted the development of a vehicle test referred to as the moose test. Moose warning signs are used on roads in regions where there is a danger of collision with the animal. The triangular warning signs common in Sweden, Norway, and Finland have become coveted souvenirs among tourists traveling in these countries, causing road authorities so much expense that the moose signs have been replaced with imageless generic warning signs in some regions. In January 2008, the Norwegian newspaper Aften Post an estimated that some 13,000 moose had died in collisions with Norwegian trains since 2000. The state agency in charge of railroad infrastructure plans to spend 80 million Norwegian kroner to reduce collision rate in the future by fencing the railways, clearing vegetation from near the tracks, and providing alternative snow-free feeding places for the animals elsewhere. In the Canadian province of New Brunswick, collisions with moose are frequent enough that all new highways have fences to prevent moose from accessing the road, as has long been done in Finland, Norway, and Sweden. A demonstration project, Highway 7, between Fredericton and St. John, which has one of the highest frequencies of moose collisions in the province, did not have these fences until 2008 although it was and continues to be extremely well signed. Newfoundland and Labrador recommended that motorists use caution between dusk and dawn because that is when moose are most active and most difficult to see, increasing the risk of collisions. Local moose sightings are often reported on radio stations so that motorists can take care while driving in particular areas. An electronic moose detection system was installed on two sections of the Trans-Canada Highway in Newfoundland in 2011, but the system proved unreliable and was removed in 2015. In Sweden, a road will not be fenced unless it experiences at least one moose accident per kilometre per year. In eastern Germany, where the scarce population is slowly increasing, there were two road accidents involving moose since 2000. Domestication of moose was investigated in the Soviet Union before World War II. Early experiments were inconclusive, but with the creation of an moose farm at Pechora Ilik Nature Reserve in 1949 a small-scale moose domestication program was started involving attempts at selective breeding of animals on the basis of their behavioral characteristics. Since 1963, the program has continued at Kostroma Moose Farm, which had a herd of 33 tame moose as of 2003. Although at this stage the farm is not expected to be a profit-making enterprise, it obtains some income from the sale of moose milk and from visiting tourist groups. Its main value, however, is seen in the opportunities it offers for the research in the physiology and behavior of the moose, as well as in the insights it provides into the general principles of animal domestication. In Sweden, there was a debate in the late 18th century about the national value of using the moose as a domestic animal. Among other things, the moose was proposed to be used in postal distribution, and there was a suggestion to develop a moose-mounted cavalry. Such proposals remained unimplemented, mainly because the extensive hunting for moose that was deregulated in the 1790s nearly drove it to extinction. While there has been documented cases of individual moose being used for riding and slash or pulling carts and sleds, 
Horcloff concludes no wide-scale usage has occurred outside fairy tales. Moose are an old genus. Like its relatives, Odacoilus and Capraeolus, the genus Alsus gave rise to very few species that endured for long periods of time. This differs from the Megacerines, such as the Irish elk, which evolved many species before going extinct. Some scientists, such as Adrian Lister, grouped all the species into one genus, while others, such as Augusto Azaroli, used Alsus for the living species, placing the fossil species into the genera Servalses and Libralses. The earliest known species is Libralsis gallicis, which lived in the Pliocene epoch, about two million years ago. Libralsis gallicis came from the warm savannas of Pliocene Europe, with the best preserved skeletons being found in southern France. L. gallicis was 1.25 times larger than the Alaskan moose in linear dimensions, making it nearly twice as massive. L. gallicis had many striking differences from its modern descendants. It had a longer, narrower snout and a less developed nasal cavity, more resembling that of a modern deer, lacking any sign of the modern moose snout. Its face resembled that of the modern wapiti. However, the rest of its skull structure, skeletal structure, and teeth bore strong resemblance to those features that are unmistakable in modern moose, indicating a similar diet. Its antlers consisted of a horizontal bar 2.5 meters long, with no tines, ending in small palmations. Its skull and neck structure suggest an animal that fought using high-speed impacts, much like the doll sheep rather than locking and twisting antlers the way modern moose combat. Their long legs and bone structure suggest an animal that was adapted to running at high speeds over rough terrain. Libralsis existed until the Middle Pleistocene epoch and were followed briefly by a species called Servalsis carnutarum. The main differences between the two consisted of shortening of the horizontal bar in the antlers and broadening of the palmations, indicating a likely change from open plains to more forested environments, and skeletal changes that suggest an adaptation to marshy environments. Servalsis carnutarum was soon followed by a much larger species called Servalsis lati frons. The Pleistocene epoch was a time of gigantism, in which most species were much larger than their descendants of today, including exceptionally large lions, hippopotamuses, mammoths, and deer. Many fossils of Servalsis lati fronds have been found in Siberia, dating from about 1.2 to 0.5 million years ago. This is most likely the time at which the species migrated from the Eurasian continent to North America. Like its descendants, it inhabited mostly northern latitudes, and was probably well adapted to the cold. Servalsis lati frons was the largest deer known to have ever existed, standing more than 2.1 meters tall at the shoulders. This is bigger than even the Irish elk which was 1.8 meters tall at the shoulders. Its antlers were smaller than the Irish elks, but comparable in size to those of Libralsis gallicis. However, the antlers had a shorter horizontal bar and larger palmations, more resembling those of a modern moose. Alsus alsus appeared during the late Pleistocene epoch. The species arrived in North America at the end of the Pleistocene and coexisted with a late surviving variety or relative of Servalsis lati frons, which Azaroli classified as a separate species called Servalsis scotti, or the American stag moose. <laughs>